I'm Lauren James and I'm going to talk to you a bit about the loneliest girl in the universe. So today's video is going to be about what inspired the book. So I studied chemistry and physics at university and I was doing a bit of coursework about special relativity, about Einstein's theory that uh, time dilates the, faster, the closer to the speed of light that you travel. So the faster you get, the less time you experience. And it was a, the question was about um, a twin who left for Earth in a spaceship and travelled for like 20 years to nearly the speed of light. But while they were away from Earth, technology advanced so much that a faster spaceship was made, which was launched from Earth 20 years later with the second twin on board and started catching up with them. And by the, because it was travelling faster, it experienced time differently. So by the time the spaceships caught up, the twins were different ages. And I wasn't really interested in the twins part. I was more interested in the idea of the first person launching in a spaceship and spending their whole life travelling to a different planet only to be told that there's a faster ship that's going to overtake them and how annoyed you'd be about like dedicating your whole life to doing this only for someone else to get the credit. And that became the character of Romy and I started thinking about a girl alone on a ship and she's been born on the ship, she's been isolated from Earth her whole life and then one day she finds out a new ship is coming with a person on board. There are lots of other things that inspired the book, specifically the film Stoker, which came out in 2013 and it's got Matthew Goode and Nicole Kidman in. It's a very dark tale about a girl whose dad dies and her uncle comes home for the funeral and lives with them and very sinister things go on and the whole film is quite scary and tense and you never really know what's happening. I really like the tone and while I was writing the book I watched that film a lot to try and capture that feeling because it was such a unique experience to watch a film about a teenage girl and have like feel like she was a very scary character and she felt really well developed and that's exactly what I wanted to do with Romy. I also really love stories about isolated characters um, so like uh, Anne Frank's The Diary of a Young Girl and Lyria by Garth Nix, which is a fantasy about a girl who lives alone in a library with a dog and uh, A Closed and Common Orbit by Becky Chambers which came out this year and it's a sci-fi about um, a, a clone living alone on a planet that's like a rubbish dump and she has to try and survive and so those are the kind of things that I was I wanted to write about because it's always a challenge as a writer if you've got a book where there's absolutely no dialogue because there's only one character. I thought I would read the first chapter to you. So this is the UK edition. It's foiled. I love it a lot. So basically The Loneliest Girl in the Universe is about a girl alone on a spaceship. And one of the big things she struggles with is having to operate and look after the spaceship and make sure it doesn't break because if it breaks she dies. So she struggles a lot with the responsibility of it and has a lot of panic about it. The first part of the book is a newspaper article. Lift off for first manned interstellar ship. 26th of June, 2048, Cape Canaveral, Florida, USA. Early yesterday morning, NASA successfully launched the first ever manned spacecraft destined to travel to a different star system. The spacecraft, named the Infinity, is projected to reach the star system Alpha Centauri in less than 50 years, where it will enter orbit around planet HT3485C. This exoplanet has a 99.999% probability of being inhabitable, making it the highest scored planet outside of our solar system. The Infinity is the result of billions of dollars of investment into solar sail technology. Space travel using this method of propulsion allows the craft to accelerate to the previously impossible velocity of 0.09 light years. Current calculations predict that the infinity will reach planet HT3485C in early 2091. Once in orbit around the planet, the infinity will begin 18 months of analysis to determine whether the planet's surface can safely support human life. If planet HT3485C is, seen, is, is deemed unsuitable, the infinity will continue onwards to the nearest star system predicted to have an above 99.99% chance of habitability. The main mission of the infinity is stated by NASA as being to guarantee the long-term survival of the human race by founding extraterrestrial communities outside of planet Earth. The crew of the infinity were chosen in a gruelling decades-long application process 
which analysed every aspect of their personal and genetic history. This screening process was followed by five years of intense NASA training. The Infinity will officially pass out of our solar system at 22.54 EST tomorrow. Check back for live minute-by-minute -minute updates on the launch. Click here to learn more about the crew of the Infinity, or follow their journey via the official The Infinity social media accounts. Don't forget to vote in the global referendum to name planet HT3485C. Read about the new commercial stasis service that is promising to help civilians live long enough to see the Infinity land on planet HT3485C. Days since the Infinity left Earth. 6,817. I'm reading fan fiction in my pyjamas when I hear a nightmarish sound, the emergency alarm. Pulling an oxygen mask out of the nearest wall panel, I sprint to the helm with my heart in my throat. There's a glowing red message on the screen which reads, Asteroid collision imminent. Automatic trajectory adjustment failed. Engage manual control. I'm abruptly filled with complete and utter fear. The guidance system has crashed. I need to take manual control, otherwise we're going to be hit by an asteroid within the next few minutes. For what must be the millionth time, I wish that Dad was here to help. I try to calm down, taking slow, steady breaths as I tell myself that I'm brave and strong enough to do this. And even if that's not true, I have no choice but to do it anyway. There's no time to panic, no time to do anything except go. My attention narrows. This is something I've practised. I've been in simulations using force propulsion to minutely adjust the course of the ship since I could count. Dad trained me to operate the emergency programme in case there was a problem that he couldn't take control of himself. He joked that if there was ever an emergency before 7am, I would have to deal with it because he wasn't giving up his lion. I do exactly what I've practised in the simulations and use the joystick to line up the thrusters with the propulsion metrics on the screen. The Infinity is travelling too fast to slow down much, but my new adjustment of direction is all that's needed to make sure the asteroid misses us, if only by an arm's length. I check and agree to the trajectory angle calculated by the computer and initiate the adjustment. I watch the screen, waiting. Outside the ship, precious fuel is being used to shoot nanoparticles into space. The force of the blast into the vacuum of space will turn the ship and change the trajectory. Or at least it's supposed to. I have no idea if it's working. If for some reason the propulsion thrusters don't work or they respond too slowly, we could fly right into the asteroid. I just have to hold on and hope the ship can move in time. Minutes pass. Eventually, when I've long since started to brace myself for bad news or a horrific explosion, the alarm dies down and the screen clears. Collision avoided. I sigh in relief. By the time the asteroid nears the infinity, our course will have been adjusted just enough that we narrowly pass each other. I run to the nearest porthole to watch, hopping from foot to foot. It's coming too close, impossibly close. Shimmers of metal catch the light of, in the rough, uneven surface of the rock. Its shadow reaches me first, passing over the porthole and casting me into darkness as the asteroid approaches. For a second, I think the computer must have calculated the angles wrong. It looks like the asteroid is flying directly at the infinity. It's going to crash straight into the fragile hull of my ship, crushing everything in its path. It's going to destroy me. It's going to... Every single muscle in my body tenses in panic, a tight knot spreading from my neck down my spine as I brace for the impact. I watch, wide-eyed, as the asteroid flies past the bulkhead in a graceful swoop. There is no explosion. No crush of metal as the ship disintegrates against the rock. Instead, there's a wonderful silence as the side of the asteroid fills the porthole for two heartbeats. There's enough time for me to see craters in the dull brown rock, marks left from millions of years of impacts. The breath leaves my lungs without me noticing. Then the asteroid is gone, disappearing in the wake of the ship, falling off into deep space once more. I throw my head back and spin in a circle, overwhelmed with joy. I did it. I managed to control my worrying long enough to get the job done. I knew what to do, and I did it. It's only when the asteroid is a, a speck in the darkness, hidden among the bright stars, that I realise I've developed a raging headache. By the time my headache has gone, it's midday, and I'm starving. I sit at the helm in my dressing gown and eat a lukewarm rehydrated chicken korma, reading through the ship's manuals. The close call with the asteroid has kick-started my anxiety. I worry endlessly about things going wrong. On some days, it's all I can think about. 
Our life frozen in my bunk, overwhelmed by the responsibility resting on my shoulders. I can't run this ship, not without Dad, not on my own. I need to be prepared for the next crisis. I have to know the ship inside out, from the boilers to the propulsion thrusters to the communications and flight mapping. My coursework can wait. English literature is hardly going to be useful the next time there's a crisis. By the time I re reach page 97 of 14,875 in the manual, I'm losing focus. As I scrape the last few grains of rice from my lunch into the organic waste disposal, I remember I haven't checked my messages yet. I can't believe I've forgotten. Reading the new uplink of data from Earth is usually the first thing I do. Hearing from NASA is always the best part of my day. Often it's the only part of my day. I scroll through my inbox, skimming past the files of news articles until I reach the message from Molly. From NASA Earth, sent 20th of June 2065 to the Infinity, received 20, 23rd of February 2067. Attachments uc-podcast.zip 8 megabytes, worksheets.txt 20 kilobytes, audio transcript. Hi Romy, hope you're well sweetie. Have you been finishing all your schoolwork? Your last message said you were struggling with some of the maths. I hope you've sorted it out by now. I used to find maths really hard when I was at school too. It'll all come together in the end. I'm sending you some more worksheets in case you've completed the ones you've already got. By the time you read this, I think you'll be working on three-dimensional proportion mechanics. So that's what the attached exercises focus on. Let us know if there's anything you want us to send. I've also attached a new episode of the podcast you like. It's funny. Enjoy. Talk to you tomorrow. Molly is my therapist and miscellaneous pillar of support. She was assigned to me by NASA after my parents died to help me deal with their deaths and my unexpected promotion to commander of the Infinity. I receive messages from her every day without fail to make sure I don't get too lonely. Her first message was two hours long. I think I've listened to it over a hundred times, maybe more. It was my constant soundtrack for months. I've been alone on this spaceship since my parents died. The last time I hugged someone, smelt their shampoo or even just spoke to them face to face was the 25th of February 2062, five years ago. Right now, I'm officially further away from any other human being than anyone else has been since the evolution of the species. I'm pretty sure I've forgotten what other people feel like. When I dream, I dream in screens, a line of text, a voice in my ear, nothing real. The things people take for granted, like seeing the sky, walking on soil, feeling the wind on your skin. Well, I've never experienced any of that. I was born on the infinity. I've only ever known its clean white walls, its sterilising atmosphere and artificial gravity, its grey floors curling around the ship's hull. I circle the same small space over and over every day, and nothing changes and nothing is different. I know I sound ungrateful to be here, but I didn't choose this life. Just because my parents were clever and multi-talented enough to be picked to run the Infinity doesn't mean I'm anything special. I'm nothing like they were. I should feel proud that my parents were chosen to run this mission. I should be proud to be the first human to land on a planet and create a new civilization. I get to carve out a new home for humanity amongst the stars. But some days it's hard to remember the exciting parts. I get stuck in the memories. It's hard to focus on the future when the past is so distracting. That's the end of chapter one. I've not read out that all of that before and it was really nice I enjoyed that a lot um so yeah that's a little bit about Romy as you can see she's a very she's got a lot of history Romy has and she's not very good at telling you about it so it takes a while to understand what's been going on in her life and how she's got to the point where she's all alone on her ship but stick with her and she'll eventually let you know everything that's been going on in the, in the world of the infinity.